Okay, first proper video. Here we go. So, in case you didn't know, Japanese carriers after midway pretty much didn't exist in any of the numbers required to provide adequate cover against the US at all. And the remaining ones have the tendency to be lost to the old submarine or carrier fleet. Ooh, that was one of our last ones too. So, how do you stop aircraft without your aircraft carriers? You use a gun. Wait, no, 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 no you, you'll have your own video. Go. AA in World War II brings up imagery of flak, bombers flying through thick clouds of smoke, that thump in the air. But do you know how flak works? Well, I recommend looking up the United States Air Force training video on the subject, as it is generally one of the best ways of learning how a battery operates, and even how the ammo was supposed to avoid flak, and comes packaged with a few very old school cartoons. But here is a very brief rundown. So, using this exceptionally realistic model, let's have a look. First, an aircraft, or group of aircraft more likely, will be detected with a radar, or some spotters, or at night searchlights, and even more likely, combinations of them all. Then, the battery would be alerted, and the direction of the aircraft would be relayed to a fire control centre, or room in the case of a ship. Using other equipment like rangefinders, spotters, and even more radars, then calculate things like what kind of aircraft is this? How high is this? What would it be targeting? And how fast is it going? Using this information, a fire control computer would then process this information and send it on to the anti aircraft battery. Heavy AA shells do not have contact fuses, meaning they do not detonate when the shell hits something. Instead, they have a timed fuse. The fire control computer would have told the gunners how long to set this fuse for. Once fired, the fuse begins a countdown until it goes boom. Now we tackle two other misconceptions. It is not the explosion that damages aircraft, but rather something called shrapnel, which is tiny bits of metal from the shell. It injures crew and damages the aircraft quite a lot, as this metal is very fast and easily goes through the fuselage of even some of the most heavily armoured aircraft. The second is about the cloud of smoke left behind. Once you see that cloud of smoke, it's usually harmless. The shrapnel has either already gone up in a conical-like shape, or once it's on the way down, it would have slowed and cooled, so the damaging effect is minimal. The smoke only shows where it actually detonated, so like I said, not a problem. Once you see it, it's, it's gone. So that's how normal heavy AA works. Again, very oversimplified, but a general overview. And it is this point where I introduce to you the Type 3 shell, aka the San Shiki. Mm, definitely mispronouncing that, but here we are. Instead of just having regular anti-aircraft shells, no, 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 you need fire. They did this despite arguably causing more problems than they were trying to solve. The way this worked was the shell would be filled with steel tubes, which in turn would be filled with an incendiary mixture. Just like our land counterpart, a timer is set and it goes bang. The shrapnel was heated by 3000 degrees for about 5 seconds, producing a 17 foot flame. It was thought by gunnery officers that these were more effective than your standard high explosive shell. Now, I may come across sounding a little bit critical of the idea, and so far it does seem like alright. It's just a very strange way of dealing with something. But I introduced to you the fair few problems that plagued the idea. First of all, many factories had to retool to make this new shell, of which there are many different types of incendiary mixtures fitted in, and obviously different calibers for different ships. Second, the burrs produced from this shell is completely different to the standard high explosive. So you'd have to train the crews differently, you'd have to provide different fire control equipment, all sorts of different charts and systems. Again, just tell explaining even more people how this would work. The shrapnel instead would have using the usual cone, the actual shrapnel and flame drops down to the ground meaning that you'd actually have to fire the shell higher than you would with your standard high explosives. As I mentioned, because you had so much things had to be retrained in new equipment, it's unclear if this reached every ship and gunnery officer, or even if these corrections were implemented. 
and in one of my favourite lines in a post-war report, it is likely, however, that the Japanese naval officers were often misled by the impressive appearance of the bursts in the sky. That is right, one of the most powerful navies in the world had the same mentality as a moth. Well done, then. The shell would be first deployed on IGN Congo and Haruna on October 1943, bombarding Henderson Field in the run-up to the Battle of Guadalcanal, and would be used all the way up to the end of the war, including on Yamato and on her famous last voyage. Needless to say, that the performance shown there and the fact that I say last voyage doesn't exactly sell this as a great wonder weapon. Not in the slightest. Well, in the words of Jeremy Clarkson, on that terrible, terrible disappointment, it's time to end. I am Harry, and this has been some history. Goodbye. <laughs>